I'd like to invite Dr. John Patrick up onto the stage. It is my great pleasure to introduce him, a uh, fellow working class lad, uh, first in his family to go to university and go to medical school. Dr. Patrick trained uh, at King's College London and St. George's Hospital. Uh, he has held appointments in Britain, the West Indies and Canada. Uh, Dr. Patrick has undertaken research throughout the world in the UK, in Jamaica, Africa and Canada. For 20 years, Dr. Patrick was the Associate Professor of Clinical Nutrition in the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics in the University of Ottawa. And today, Dr. Patrick speaks to Christian and secular groups around the world on medical ethics, communicating uh, on culture, public policy, and the integration of faith and science. And today, he'll be speaking to us uh, on what Hippocrates, Hippocrates knew and what we have forgotten. And Dr. Patrick is also now the president of Augustine College, uh, which is a classical uh, community of learning uh, in Ottawa. Uh, over to you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to hear you sing. It's a long while since I've given a talk in an academic setting that began in such a way. I have lived in the, the deserts of the university for the whole of my life. Uh, and that was an oasis, so thank you. And T.S. Eliot as well. Yes. Um, one of the lines of Eliot that I think about when he's talking about God, and he says, prepare, to him, prepare for him who knows how to ask questions. And the Lord does ask questions of us. I was a Christian from a Christian home. Not the usual way to introduce it, because I don't have a conversion story as such. Uh, I never knew a time when I didn't believe the story was true. What I knew was a long period of life where I didn't act as though it was true, which is what you face. Uh, this oasis that you live in, in the, at the moment will have to be left at some point. And it's that that I want to talk about in a way, but particularly in relation to my own profession of a physician. This particular talk, like many that I give, I owe to students. If you want one of the best books I've read recently that is owed to students is Leon Cass's book on finding wisdom in, Gen in Genesis. Leon Cass is one of the best scholars in uh, North America, professor of biochemistry uh, and of uh, teaching in many other faculties. That book came out of a study in his home and then became a course in the University of Chicago, which was booked on day one. Uh, if you didn't get there then, you didn't get in, but it did have a prerequisite that you be fluent in Hebrew. So I suppose there was a limited supply. Uh, but what he did in that book was remind me of how shallow my reading is so often. I had read Genesis 1, had it read to me dozens of times. And that's an understatement by a country mile. And yet he was able to stop me in my tracks in the very first chapter. Which two things in the first chapter of Genesis do not get an individual prize, so to speak. Uh, everything God does, he looks at it, that's good. But two things don't get a personal good. And it's very interesting to think about why. And his explanations were stunning. And of course, I had never thought of anything like that before. But you're not going to get that kind of wisdom today. I'm not in that league. So we should start with prayer. You need that I should start in prayer as much as I do. <laughs> So let us pray. Lord, we know that there is nothing within us that you do not know. Our hearts are open to thee. Our ideas, our dreams, everything is known to you, and yet you continue to love us. We, are, we know also that without you we can do nothing, but you promise your spirit, and we pray for that spirit now, that what is said from you, what comes from you, may be understood and held in mind, and what is not may be forgotten. For Christ's sake. Amen. I was in my 40s before students got on my case. Um, 
I said to an IVCF leader in a cocktail party, oh yes, I know about IV. I went for a few weeks when I was a student, but I'm allergic to evangelical smiles. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, sometimes in church I almost say that, but I try not to. I went, if Martin Lloyd-Jones was speaking, or John Stott, I was somewhat spoiled, you see, because at your age, I had that choice on Sunday. I did go to church for the first five years uh, in the university, but then it, there was a long gap. Uh, quite a choice, isn't it, Martin Lloyd-Jones or John Stott, and there was Dick Lucas in the wings. Um, when we came to Canada, I... We couldn't, in Ottawa, there wasn't anything that approached that for preaching. Uh, it was a desert. And it's hard to flourish in a desert. We went to a little church which believed the gospel was true, at least. I refer to it as the most loving and the most ignorant church I've ever been in. And the ignorance has only grown over, over the years. Back to that cocktail party, I said to the IVCF guy that I, I stopped going to IV unless there was a really good speaker. Uh, he didn't get mad with me. He'd gone to Oxford. I was at the University of London. Uh, he finished his undergraduate degree, worked for InterVarsity for uh, at least 30 years without a break. I travelled the, the road of ambition uh, and was allowed to be successful in that area with the pains that go with that, like realizing now that I neglected my children at times. Uh, I certainly wasn't the easiest person in the world to get on with. A few people left nursing because of my tongue. So I had plenty to re regret. But I said to John, only about 20% of medical students will end up going back to church before they're 40. We do tend to come back later. Uh, you it, here will have a special set of statistics, I'm sure, but it won't be perfect by any means. That September, uh, when I started teaching, a young man knocked on my door. He had been at that meeting. Uh, that speak speech and he said quite reasonably are you actually a Christian and I said well, yeah I accept the question is justified there's if I was hauled up on a charge of being a Christian at that point there wouldn't have been enough evidence to convict uh, but I said I do believe the story is true and that therefore I have some obligations towards our Lord and I admit they don't show except in my family. But why do you ask? He said, well, there are four of us in first year that I know already who do not want to lose their faith. Uh, will you help us? I was about to say no, uh, which would have been an honest answer, when my mother turned up at the back of my head and said, you could do that, you ought to do that. So I gave in. If you knew my mother, you know why. Uh, <laughs> What would you like me to do? Well, uh, he, sa he said, could you do some Bible studies to help us integrate the practice of medicine and faith? Uh, and I knew I could, so I said, well, you're all neurotic about learning already, so you better come to my house at eight o'clock at night after you've done some study and we'll take it from there. And I'll do four weeks. I did 10 years. Um, the really arranged, and I think they still do, or they haven't been for a while, uh, a conference between Christmas and New Year. It was arranged by the medical students and from the six medical schools. 
Uh, and this particular year uh, was going to turn out to be somewhat extraordinary because uh, they'd got it all arranged and then a few weeks before the, uh, the conference was to take place, uh, the speaker got a serious cancer. So he wasn't going to be able to come. So the students telephoned around. and Then the ones from Ottawa said, John Patrick could do it, but he doesn't like travelling, he doesn't like doing anything without you bullying him. But <laughs> So say your prayers and see if we can get him to come. And uh, I said no, of course. Uh, <laughs> and then asked where it was, and it was in a place called Muskoka, and that's about 60 miles from where I lived at that point. And in December, I could go right through the middle of Algonquin Park, and at least I would have the uh, fun of seeing at least half a dozen moose on the way. In fact, when I got there, one of the students that was driving there had seen a moose rather too closely and had no windscreen. <laughs> But fortunately, they were not hurt, which is amazing. Of course, I enjoyed it. It's always that way. I love actually doing what I'm doing now. I hope that's apparent. Uh, but what I didn't know was in the audience was a mature Christian student and her husband, who was a youth pastor in a charismatic Baptist church, which I thought was a contradiction in terms, but maybe not. <laughs> But they, they also had been planning a conference another two or three weeks ahead, and another person had fallen sick. Uh, and the same process was going on, and they being who they are, had, you know, done their thing. And, <laughs> and God had told them to do nothing. The speaker would be provided. Um, these two were listening to me, and then they agreed in the spirits. The language is still not mine. Uh, that I was going to be the speaker. They didn't tell me. They went back to uh, their church, told them what they'd heard, and they agreed in the Spirit, and they, they called me and said, uh, the Holy Spirit's told us you're going to speak at our conference. And I said, <laughs> well, he hasn't told me. <laughs> you're in Toronto with a few million people. You can find a speaker in Toronto. Uh, I'm not driving to uh, Toronto in the middle of winter. Uh, I don't like driving anyway, and I don't like the 401 in winter at all. Find someone there. They said, well, will you pray about it? I said, I'll certainly pray about it, uh, but I'm fairly confident of the answer. I put the phone down. Shortly after that, it rang again. This time, it was a Canadian Dairy Bureau, and uh, they wanted me to do a lecture. And I'm a cynic, or less so than I used to be, um, so I asked exactly when will this be, and it wasn't very far away. So I knew that they, it was the dairy company, they were thinking about contracts for the milk supply, for pediatric hospitals. They had a deal of some sort, they'd promised a speaker, and he'd bailed out. Now they were looking at a great deal of embarrassment. I could charge whatever I wished. You shouldn't do that, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, I won't tell you how much I was paid for that weekend. But then I asked where this conference was going to be, and I already knew where it was going to be. <laughs> it was Toronto. And I wasn't going to be driving the 401. I was flying. So I said, what would you say if I came back on Sunday night? They said, it's a cheaper ticket, no problem, go ahead. So I called the church and said, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the Canadian Dairy Bureau. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll come. God hadn't finished with me. Uh, we got there, as usual for these things on Friday night, and these people were wandering in up to 11 o'clock, singing happy songs, or sort of happy songs. Uh, not like you were singing this morning, I can assure you. And then at 11 o'clock at night, they said, will you start to speak? 
I said very briefly, and it was brief, I said, tomorrow morning we start on Christ Christian discipline. Basically, you go to bed tonight and get up, and we'll start tomorrow. <laughs> the next morning, I didn't think I was in the right place. The next morning I got up and uh, went for a walk down to the lake. And as I walked down to the lake, um, I passed a young couple with two children. As I passed, the man in the party said, oh, I met you before. I said, oh, where? He said, British Columbia. I said, I doubt it, haven't been there for more than 10 years. He said, that would be about right. I looked at him, that would make you a teenager. He said, yes, I was a teenager. I said, where in British Columbia? He said, Kitimat. And I nearly fell over. Kitimat is right up on the Alaska border. And in 1973, I'd come from Jamaica with my family and not enough money to get back. I knew I could get a locum and the money. And so we, had a, we met our friends in Vancouver, had a holiday, and then I went to the college with my bits of paper and they found me a job in Kitimat. So we went there for 10 days or two weeks. Lovely uh, trip up the channel with the whales jumping around you. And we had a wonderful time. But what I said, that was a long while ago ago how come you remember and he said well you came to our church with your family and my mother's very hospitable she brought you home to lunch and while she was out making coffee you got up and I warn you if you invite me anywhere I do this everywhere it's compulsion I can't stop it I got up and look at the bookshelves to see how many wonderful Christian books had intact spines which is usually all of them uh, <laughs> And there were such, but not quite the usual density. And she came back in, a very, very perceptive lady, and she said, what's wrong with our books? And I'm, this is hearsay now. I was told that morning in Toronto that I had said, why don't you get some decent ones? And I have to admit it's a possibility. <laughs> but she didn't get mad. She made me write a book list. Now, her husband was chief engineer at the only reason for Kitimat's existence, which is a hydroelectric plant feeding the production of alumina. Uh, but what I learned from her son was that she got those books, changed her reading habits, her family's reading habits, her church's reading habits, and it developed a ministry picking up the kids who were dropping out of school, bringing them home, straightening their lives, and getting them to work again, getting them back to school all because of one very rude sentence from me. God can use anything, can't he? Well, he's used, a, he's used an ass in the past, so I suppose I fit in somewhere there. All this to say that you, you can be, God knows what you're saying and thinking. Don't ever play games of that sort. Uh, and he made you, he knew what you were gonna do, and he thought it was a worthwhile risk. Now, this talk today comes out of that kind of background. The students would come to my house and ask me to go to graduation. I never went to graduation until they did the only way that would get me there, which was our parents want to talk to you. Um, so I don't think I went more than twice in 20 years in the university. A waste of time. I got better things to do. But on this occasion, I was late, of course, and as I walked in, the medical students were saying what was labelled in the programme the Hippocratic Oath. But I was well enough educated to know that, that couldn't be the yeah, Hippocratic Oath. And everywhere, students modified the night before to bend the knee to the homosexual community or whatever. Uh, it's disgraceful. You shouldn't call it the Hippocratic Oath. You should call it by its proper name. Postmodern woke students with no education have written this, it should say at the bottom. <laughs> but not here, of course. I couldn't believe it. I got a copy. And this talk stems from what happened from there on. The ancient world. I didn't know enough about Hippocrates that time. I started reading, and uh, there's not a lot to learn. But... What I realized as I thought about the oath, that there are four key ideas in there, which I hope you will take away with you, particularly if you're going to medicine, into medicine, but even if you are not, because I 
really and truly think that we will have to bring medicine back into the church where it started if it's going to survive. Uh, nobody can tell you what it's going to be like when AI has blown its way through. At least we may get rid of the unwanted bureaucrats. Um, that's been the, the, the department that has grown most in my lifetime by a country mile is the bureaucrats. I joke that the first hospital I worked in was run by the hospital secretary, his secretary, a telephonist and a dog. Uh, because in hospitals, the, the unit of the ward does not need a bureaucrat, and if it does, the bureaucrat should be right there on the ward seeing what's actually going on instead of sending useless and uh, destructive memos and asking for data they don't understand. They usually didn't ask me, well, they'd ask me once, and I would not answer them with what they wanted. I would send back an email saying, what are you going to use this data for? And when they told me, I would ask them, and which statistics pack that you don't understand are you lifting down from the net internet? And I didn't hear any more. <laughs> because, of course, most things in medicine are not normally distributed, so standard statistics are inappropriate. But that's all beside the point. So uh, the first thing that I realized about this oath, maybe I should, and my wife says I should do this all the while, and sometimes I hear her, and she said it now. Tell them what you're going to say. I want to point out four things, that without transcendence, you can have neither justice nor a moral structure. And these amazing Greeks understood that. Secondly, that medicine is not a tech, primarily a technical or scientific activity, it's a moral one. Thirdly, trust is absolutely essential, and killing takes trust away, so doctors should not kill. And within that context, it is in the interest of the patients that they give the rights of conscience to the doctor. Obama made no provision for conscience rights in Obamacare. In other words, he'd written a bomb to destroy medicine, because that's what would happen. Because anybody who had a conscience would be fired quite quickly, if it didn't happen to agree with the current government's views or whoever is running the system. You don't take down uh, 3,000 years of history without more discussion and thought than that. I think when that bill came through, somebody said in your governmental circles, well, we had to pass it so that we could read it, uh, admitting that they hadn't read it yet. How could you, the number of pages that were there? So those four things I want to talk about. I do wish there was a clock in sight. How many minutes have already gone? Because I already got off track twice, so we're going to try and stay on track. 20. Okay. Transcendence. The person who writes about this as well as anything, if you, how many of you have ever heard of the Australian analytical philosopher David Stove? Oh my goodness, no one. Well, you've got a, a real joy in sight. David Stove committed suicide when he got cancer, which is perfectly rational if you're an agnostic or atheist, which he was. But he's also a very good analytical uh, philosopher, and he can't stand Kant, not with a K, with a C. Uh, and the book is called Darwinian Fairy Tales, and the title tells you a lot. It's hilariously funny and very acerbic, and he takes down any idea that without something beyond yourself, you could end up with the kind of world you actually want, but we can't have. You cannot get morality from Darwin, is his basic thesis, which of course is obviously true, and, but he does it in a beautiful way. Even the chapter titles will make you want to read it. The Horse in the Bathroom, Tax and the Single Girl. I mean, you, you already want to read it, don't you? <laughs> Written by a philosopher, and you can understand it. So... He understood, and it's always good to find an atheist who will make your point for you. Uh, they are gold. 
for apologetics. So I always look for atheists that I can refer to to underpin or, in fact, build my thesis upon. Uh, and he will do for this one very well. It's very simple, really, to prove that he's right. I only know a few people here, so it has to be Craig who serves as my example. Imagine that Craig had, has cancer. And imagine that last week in my laboratory, I invented a cure for that cancer. Ought I to give it to him? Come on, play the game. It's much more fun that way. Ought I to give it to him? The girls are saying yes. The boys are refusing. OK. <laughs> he's a good looking guy, actually, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but he's married. <laughs> but what if he's a well wealthy man and when he dies, I inherit his estate and nobody knows I've got my cure yet and I am a Darwinian. What am I going to do now? Well, if it truly is a battle of genes, I've got 21 grandchildren, naturally, and 100 by adoption from my daughter in Malawi who's been picking up abandoned children for 20 years. Um, there's plenty of money could be spent there, much better than on him. So why wouldn't I let him die to pick up the first winnings? Because it'll take 10 years to market my cure. There's no reason. The physical facts do not give you the moral injunctions. Lewis said, if nothing can be presumed, nothing can be proved. And here, no, that's not true. Five minutes? Oh my goodness. Uh, can you come back tonight for session two? <laughs> Um, so transcendence is necessary. You want your doctor to fear judgment after death. If you don't, you'll be fearing your doctor. The next thing, the moral injunction, is covered in that to a degree. You're smart, you can work it out. Uh, I do want to say a little bit about the sanctity of life and how that works into this. Uh, it's very important. And you're going to be facing it. You, you've done a horrible experiment in Oregon, and, you, and of course the results are often presented inappropriately. But it will necessarily undermine uh, trust. I heard not long ago of a professor in Belgium where they've been doing this for a long while. Uh, his mother was at the other end of Belgium, not a long way away. But the hospital called and said, your mother asked for euthanasia this morning. We've done it. Will you please come and get the body? it can get to that degree of callousness. Already, there's good evidence that people are being killed against their will. But the notes that are written will say otherwise, and nothing will happen. Nobody should go to see a doctor in the current system. You've got to get used to the fact that the church has a duty to provide someone to go with them who doesn't go stay outside the clinic, but goes inside the clinic, someone who is not intimidated by the system, especially the elderly need that. You start providing that in your church, people will start queuing up to come for that alone. It's always in this area that things go really badly. From Hippocrates to Jesus was the time it took for it to become dominant. After that, it was not challenged until the 1930s seriously and only academically in about the 19th century when people like me would say uh, things like this, we are breeding better animals, we ought to breed better people. Nobody discussing the key, word, key words of better and ought. Uh, I spent my life with three groups of children who would not fit in a better animal category severely handicapped children with quadriplegia, the malnourished children of the developing world, and cystic fibrosis kids, all of whom the liberal elite wish to destroy before they're born, if they can. But it changed. The first act of the Nazi government was to legalize euthanasia before they did anything else. Uh, and it made syrupy movies about uh, patriotic parents of handicapped children who had their children exterminated. Um, in those days, there were lots of hospitals at the edge of town. We had no neuroactive drugs that would calm people down, so we had asylums, and they were run by psychiatrists and neurologists. 
and they were now in loco parentis. So the first killings in a systematic way were done by doctors. The first gas chamber was built by a psychiatrist. They showed that they were somewhat aware that this wasn't right because they wouldn't use an ambulance to take their patients to the killing place. But they bought a bus out of their own pocket and on the side it said the charitable transportation company for the sick. You always get euphemism when things are being done badly. Watch out for them. Uh, it only became the Nazi policy when they started killing the Jews. Initially, the Wehrmacht would force these Jews to strip naked and dig a trench, and then they shot them into it. That really upset the soldiers, and they started drinking too much and becoming less good soldiers, and Hitler couldn't have his beloved Wehrmacht damaged. So they hesitated, and then they found out about the doctors. They handed the whole program over to the medical profession. There were more doctors in the SS by a large amount compared to their uh, numbers in the population. So if you arrived at Auschwitz, you were met on the station platform by doctors who looked at you and cursorily said, not enough muscle mass to, to work, straight to the gas chamber. Enough muscle mass to work, we'll thin you off and get some work out of you and then to the gas chamber. Nobody survived, unless, except when the Allies arrived. There's a book that you ought to have on your shelf if you are, have any tendency to think that these things might be, have some good in them. It's called The Nazi Doctors by an American uh, whose name I've currently forgotten, but you won't have any difficulty finding him. Psychiatrist who went to the Nuremberg trials to find out what on earth was going on. And of course, uh, the answer he got was we were simply obeying orders. So if you ever find yourself saying, we're obeying orders when, for what you know is wrong. Put yourself on the platform at Auschwitz. I have to stop. But I'm going to stop by reading my favorite account of what it means to be a doctor. And those of you who are medical, it's, it was written in the 17th century by one of you, actually, so to speak, your end of the theological spectrum. And this is how it goes. It becomes every man who purposes to give himself to the care of others seriously to consider the four following things. First, that he must one day give an account of all the lives entrusted to his care, to the supreme judge. Secondly, that all his skill and knowledge and energy, as they have been given by God, so they should be exercised for his glory and the good of mankind and not for mere gain or ambition. Thirdly, and not more beautifully than truly, let him reflect that he has undertaken the care of no mean creature. For in order that he may estimate the value, the greatness of the human race, the only begotten Son of God became himself a man, and thus ennobled it, and far more than this died um, to redeem it. And fourthly, let the doctor being himself a mortal man, be diligent and tender in relieving his suffering patients, inasmuch as he himself must one day be a like sufferer. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry that I was totally out of control for a little while. <laughs> if you want to hear just the Hippocratic Oath, you can find it on YouTube. It's something of a miracle, actually. It was 20 years ago, the thing that's on YouTube, in the University of Madison. Uh, and in that very liberal university, it was the Christian student groups who had prayed about it. So we had a full uh, auditorium. And after the lecture, the, the liberal students went to the, the dean and demanded and got a complete reorganization of their ethics program. So prayer does work. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath uh, starts by envisaging the uh, kind of a familial relationship between the, the, the doctor and the, the student. And I want to thank you for um, 
Uh, an apprenticeship model, yes. And, and thank you for uh, your testimony of uh, your medical career and how you've modelled that uh, in your own, uh, your own experience with, with students. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Uh, just a few questions arising from yeah. um, what you have said. Um, you, you talked about needing to put medicine, or bring medicine back into the church. Yes. Uh, now, this is a community we've got uh, doctors who are providing direct primary care, um, direct surgery is starting yeah. up. Uh, what are some of the ways in which you see medicine being brought back into the church? I mean, some of the people here, um, you know, Lord willing, there'll be a few who, who go on to medical school, uh, mm. but uh, most will not. How, how can we all be involved in some way in bringing medicine back into the church? I think there are a good number of ways, actually. Um, perhaps one of the first ones will be pure money. Um, you may or may not know that if you're in church three Sundays out of four, your family's lifetime health care costs will be approximately one quarter of the general American cost. In other words, Christians are paying for the rest of the world's treatment without even getting a charitable deduction, uh, which they obviously should get. Now, it's not difficult to see what's going on at this point. Um, but I'll leave that for one moment and turn to the next reason. Most of certainly family practice uh, work is not actually about medicine in the way that you think about it. Because certainly in, a, in an inner city uh, clinic, over 90% of the patients coming to the clinic will be at least in part responsible for their own disease, their behavior. That's been the big change in my lifetime. When I started in clinical medicine in the distant past, uh, the only things people were ashamed of was sexually transmitted disease, stupid accidents, even smoking wasn't wrong, but alcohol could obviously destroy you. That was it. Uh, everything else, they had no guilt attached. That's been the big change. I didn't see my first drug addict till I was 26. You can imagine what that, what that change amounts to in my life. Um, so, you've got the changing etiology of disease, uh, and you've got cost. That's a big driver. The next thing is going to be, I mean, COVID was an example, uh, mismanagement on a grave scale, uh, because the people running it were political, just the same as uh, only politicians could pretend that carbon could be a pollutant. I mean, you're all made out of carbon, for God's sake. Uh, I was delighted the other day to, to be watch, looking at YouTube. I, I like watching your Congress, because it sometimes is better than comedy anyway. Uh, but. But they had the woman on who's in charge of the EPA, and the guy asked her, what's the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? She didn't know. And uh, so after a few minutes fussing around, she said, well, it's 400 parts per million. He said, I asked for percentages. She couldn't turn 400 parts per million in her head into a percentage. Well, it doesn't get much easier than that. 0.04%, madam. Uh, argon is more uh, in the, there's more argon in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide. We're currently in a low uh, because they've played with the results, as always. They compare them to the end of the 19th century, which was the lowest carbon dioxide level for a long while. They should have had, and you should demand, whenever anyone talks about this, I want to see geological timescales. Uh, you, you find the most extraordinary graph. I mustn't get off on that. I, how did I get to there? Never mind. <laughs> so back to, back to uh, the church. Because of these things, you really will need a doctor who shares your beliefs. Uh, I have a daughter with nine children. Uh, when she'd had three, she discovered that her obstetrician had decided to do abortions as well. Do you think she wanted to go back to him again? No. And she has every right. He has already decided something about human life which is not compatible with medicine as I see it. So you take the, the four points I was talking about, you talk, talk about the nature of the change in disease. Obviously, if 
disease is now primarily a theological problem, which it is, and we have no the theology going on in the general population and frequently not in church, right? Uh, we have problems. Not only does it need to come back into the church, the church has got to get more serious about what it believes and be able to defend it. So is your suggestion then that um, we need to create an alternative system for, for Christians in which we have doctors who share uh, our yeah, I mean, commitments and um, that we don't have the political influences that um, we're not funding um, the consequences of an immoral lifestyle? Uh, is that what you're, you're proposing? Or are there ways in which we can be involved in the, the reformation of healthcare in the nation as a, yes. as a whole? Yes, uh, hugely necessary. Uh, but the problem is, when, when I was dragged out of my ivory tower and started talking to doctors, I, I couldn't believe what was happening. What, what happened? I wrote a very angry paper one afternoon because my most hated faculty, the one that I would put a bomb under without any problem at all, take, <laughs> uh, I'd take the people out first, but uh, it's a faculty of education. Uh, I hold them responsible for the destruction of learning. Uh, but um, I'm losing my track at a point. Uh, a very angry paper. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> yeah, the very academic thing. Up the steps. What am I talking about? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, so they sent a missive around our university saying that teaching should be from a morally neutral position. And of course, the position doesn't exist. I was furious. Um, uh, I just sat down and wrote a paper. Uh, it flowed, and I sent it to a friend who published it without my permission. Uh, <laughs> only in a small um, magazine for Christian doctors in Canada. But that paper went round the world. It had more reads than stuff in the mainline literature. Obviously, you don't know this because if we, you'd wonder why you're doing science, but the average scientific paper is read by six people, including the referees. Uh, it's not about knowledge, it's about ego, and they don't read my CV, they weigh it. Uh, I'm glad of that, I wouldn't want anyone to wade through it. But that's the world we live in. So that started me thinking about what we could do about this. And then the Americans asked, called me and said, will you come and talk to us? And I said, well, sort of talk I give you, you've got somebody who can do it there. And uh, the guy running CMDA US said, I don't know who they are. He said, I've been back for, as a missionary running this evangelical, the 20,000 member uh, organization for Christian physicians, largely evangelical. And he said, they're a fellowship organization, but we're sailing towards very choppy waters, and this is the first thing I've read that helped. And I said, I find that hard to believe, but I agreed, and I went and I gave uh, four talks at a conference. Uh, my wife was in Africa at the time. Uh, when she stayed on uh, to look after refugees, I was doing six talks a, a year, and when she got back, it was over 100, and it peaked at 400. Um, when they called me from, from CMDA and said, we want you to go to San Francisco, I said, have you done any geography? Uh, I live in Ottawa. It's exactly the opposite corner of the continent. Find someone in San Francisco. And they said, we don't know anyone. Uh, I said, that can't be true. But sadly, it is. Uh, I still find it incredibly hard to believe. There are a few young people coming through now, thank God, but we're, we have nowhere near the number we have. And you guys, some of you will be asked to talk to medical conferences. I have one piece of advice that I really want you to sew away somewhere. Doctors process data very, very quickly. They get bored very, very quickly. So in good academics come along and start dotting the I's and crossing the T's, they fall asleep. Uh, you've got to go fast, they can stow it all away, because that's what, when a patient comes in, you've got a complaint, and what you're doing in your head, it doesn't even reach consciousness most of the time, is comparing the complaint to a set of models. And when you get a fit, you've got the diagnosis. And if you don't get it, you'll be chewing it over for the day or a week or whatever. Uh, you've got to keep them going. 
So they are highly intelligent barbarians, is a good description. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've left my timepiece by my chair. Yeah. We've got time for... We're going to wrap things up now. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Craig was uh, surfing the web uh, at the end of the talk and found the author of the, the title, Nazi Doctors. It is Robert J. Uh, Lifton. Lifton. Yeah. Robert J. Lifton. Um, yeah. I haven't lost the ability to write uh, decipherable handwriting. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Patrick, for yeah. this afternoon.